This week on Crossfeed. Mormons and the Cross. Can a bride of Christ reject Christ? Is torture Christian? Churches and the swine flu. And church date talks reach a climax. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Crossfeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Hey, everybody, Pastor Jim Butler out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts. It is so good to uh, be with you all again and pray that uh, you uh, enjoy our podcast this evening. It's good to be back. Yep. I'll let you know right now, before I forget, we will not have a show next week. Uh, my kids have some stuff going on, and it's just not going to work out schedule wise. So, going to take a um, take a week off. So, and, uh, however, you can go to our website crossfeednews.com and look up past shows. So, uh, you know, you can do you know best of Crossfeed News next week if 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 you're going through withdrawal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, best of. Just keep telling yourself that. <laughs> Hey, what can I tell you? Oh, but uh, I just got back from Florida. As I mentioned last week, my father passed away. And so um, last Sunday afternoon <coughs> for the funeral and I uh, had a um, very good time with my family and seeing all of them. And the the pastor, he probably doesn't listen to this, but Gene Johnson at uh, Grace Lutheran Church in um, uh Port St. Lucie, Florida, wonderful message. Um, just a powerful proclamation of the gospel and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And I was very, very pleased. Good. Oh, very nice, Ben. Well, so, where do you want to start tonight? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, let's begin with, um, let's begin with the nuns. Okay. Now, because, you know, generally we, we like to think of Roman Catholicism as being fairly conservative, I mean, especially with Pope Benedict. But sometimes we don't realize that there is a, a strong, um, almost liberal um, element within it. Almost. Uh, okay, yeah, there is a liberal <laughs> element within it, uh, which is interesting. So um, there's this... Um, Sin Sinawa Dominican sister by the name of Lori Brink, uh, Sister Lori Brink, and um, it's interesting that this is 2009 and they're just reporting on this now. Yeah, because uh, this is a leadership conference uh, of leadership conference of women religious uh, in 2007. And uh, she says that religious titles, institutional limitations, ecclesiastical uh, authorities no longer fit this congregation, which is in most respects post-Christian. Um, she said, for these women, the Jesus narrative is not only is not the only or the most important narrative. They still hold up and reference the values of the gospel, but they also recognize that these same values are not solely the property of Christianity. So uh, she says that you know many of them are now post-Christian. They have it's time for them to move beyond the church. Well, many of the Catholic religious orders have moved beyond the church, even beyond Jesus. Yeah, I you know I don't understand how you can call yourself a Catholic, especially call yourself a nun. I mean, isn't that the whole thing? They're the bride of Christ, or the it's why they don't marry because they're married to Jesus in a sense, and now they've moved beyond him. They're Cheating on him? <laughs> well, if you take the some of the Old Testament pictures of, of God, you know, calling himself jealous in his picture of uh, being the bride of Christ, and if you follow the um, other gods, you are committing religious adultery. Absolutely, yeah, that would be cheating on him. That's exactly the picture the Old Testament has of God. And because uh, I know when I was a kid, that 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 first uh, commandment, "I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God," I wondered. I, really struggled with that picture. But the idea is that he demands our exclusive attention. 
Um, and it, this is this is really kind of I think strange. Uh, I like this. They still reverence and value the reverence the values of the gospel, but they recognize these same values are not solely the property of Christianity. Well, absolutely, because th- when you're talking again in those terms, the the values of Christianity, you're talking the law, and the law is across um, religions. The relig- the law is written in the human hearts. Uh, but there is nothing there about the gospel. Right. You know, the value of grace, the value of unconditional love, the value that you are saved and it's nothing that you do, that is the unique value of Christianity. Yeah, but if they didn't, you know, if if they didn't really understand that from the beginning, um, it's no big surprise that they're going to move on you know, to something else that's basically just the same thing repackaged. Right. <laughs> Absolutely, and finding you know these connections and these things with other religions. Well, of course, absolutely, because that's what we have in common with them. So, but I just you know I don't understand the whole concept of uh, of having allegiance to an organization. Um, you know, especially as a nun, you you know you've sort of dedicated your life to service within this organization, and your um and then you you just going to take the the teachings of that organization and throw it out and still say that you're uh, you know faithful to the organization no you're not but, but there's nothing but that's 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 been going on for years even back in I, I saw a reprint of an article from i think it was the 1970s or early 80s um by George Planes who used to be the religion editor for the Cleveland Plains dealer um, and um, wonderful. I think he was Lutheran, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I might be. If anybody knows, uh, remembers him, uh, he can tell me whether or not he actually was Lutheran, or if he if he's even still alive and still writing, for that matter. Uh, after getting caught up on Bruce Metzger a few a, a month <laughs> or so ago, I yeah, you know, I want to double check on that. But anyhow, uh, um, I think it was Plenas was his name, who's the Cleveland Cleveland Plain dealer. Anyway. Um, but he said, you know, one of his things was talking to some of these pastors and finding out pastors who who didn't believe in the basics of Christianity. And he asked one of them, well, what do you do about the, you know, the Apostles' Creed? And he goes, oh, I just say they believe. <laughs> yeah, because they believe it and I don't. Um, I, I was – and uh, I know we've got a couple – you know, we have George who's an ELCA pastor and we have uh, – I think it's Dave, who's uh, works for the ELCA uh, Youth Ministries down in the the, the southeastern synod. Uh, so you know, don't take this too personally, guys. But seriously, I actually had a conversation with an ELCA pastor um, in uh, when I served in Rockford, who asked me if I believed that that Jesus physically rose from the dead. And I'm like, well, yeah. He said, no, seriously. You know, if you, if you had a video camera there, would you see a real live body coming out of the, the grave, out of the tomb? Yeah. Yeah, he took it all kind of metaphysically. He didn't believe in the res- really believe in the resurrection. So the whole like, do you have any fish thing, or here t- touch my, um, touch the wounds and and see that it's really me. So I mean, you know, that's kind of the thing is Jesus proved to them it was physical resurrection. You know because. Uh, yeah, That's assuming you're not a follower follower of Boltmann, and with the idea that um, the church added all of this. I mean, if you understand form criticism and the idea that a lot of these these, these things were added by the church later on, you know, and that was one of the things that was added then and didn't really happen. Okay, so when do they think these things were added? Well, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons, you know, some of them give very, very late dates for some of the Gospels. is because that's been, you know. Yeah, but, I mean, the writings uh, of St. Paul were some of the earliest Christian writings, and he firmly held to physical resurrection. Yeah. Uh, I, I've never understood all of it myself, but, you know, you, you have to understand for form critics— you know, the Gospels are like, you know, the Gospels are like ogres. They have layers. 
No. Personally, I think they should be like parfaits. Everybody likes parfaits. What I think. Yeah. Parfaits have layers, and in the morning, I'm making waffles. So, uh... <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's just you know, um, um, you know, that's just the, the the way that they look at it, and that stuff was all added later. Um, I mean, uh, uh, um, but so you know, that's why then they can they can say that you know they they you know hold to the tenets of Christianity, but it's with that understanding. So, yeah, I don't know. I've just never understood that. So you know, the apostles they made this stuff up and then were willing to suffer torture and death for it. So, I, you know, I don't get it. But well, but you got to understand the apostles didn't make it up. Uh, the the church did, the institution did, and it answered questions that were going on to them. There is the real Jesus, and then there's the 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 the, the Christ of Christianity, and it was added to the person who Jesus was. I mean, if you get back to the real, you know, the real radical, super radical critics, and the guys in the Jesus seminar, you know, or maybe in the Gospels, Jesus said the word the, um, you know, but even that's questionable, uh, you know. And of course, then there are those who who just said this is getting just absolutely silly. Sorry about this. Yeah, I know it's a bit silly. So yeah, I you know, I don't know. It's it's too bad when when someone is, you know, dedicated their lives to Christ and then just sort of throw them out or or throw them in the mix with everybody else. You've just completely missed the point. And maybe I you know. I would, my guess would be that they never had the point to begin with, and that's how you end up there. I just anybody that really understands what the gospel means, um, you know, even if they don't agree with it, has to understand that you can't just say it's the same as every other religion, because it's exactly the opposite of every other religion. Absolutely. So, but speaking of people being tortured, um. Let's move on. There's been a, a a survey that was done by the uh, Pew uh, Research Group again, and uh, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, and they interviewed people on their attitudes toward torture, which it's been a big topic uh, with the whole Guantanamo Bay and um, and uh, uh, President Obama's uh, changing the rules on what the army can and can't do. Um. And so they found that more than half of people who attend services at least once a week, 54%, said the use of torture against suspected terrorists is often or sometimes justified. Only 42% of people who seldom or never go to services agreed. I'm surprised that it's that close, you know? It's it's pretty tight. It's It's within... It's within ten percentage points on both sides of um, of fifty percent. You know, um, white evangelical Protestants were the religious group most likely to say that torture is often or sometimes justified. More than six in ten uh, people unaffiliated with any religious organization were the least likely to back it. Only four in ten of them did, and the. I, I don't understand why they said religious group. Um, I guess they didn't have a better term for it. Most likely to say the torture is never justified was Protestant denominations such as Episcopalians, Lutherans, and Presbyterians. Uh, categorized as mainline Protestants in contrast to evangelicals. Just over three in ten of them said the torture is never justified. A quarter of the religiously unaffiliated said the same compared with two in ten white non-Hispanic Catholics. And one in eight evangelicals. A lot of numbers to throw at at you, but basically, um, what it comes down to is the uh, more conservative, and I might even say Republican, um, because there's definitely, I think, some political influence here. Um, the, uh, the 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 evangelical vote um, tends to, and you know, fifty four percent is not a huge um, percentage, but, um, they, you know, the tendency is to say that torture at sometimes at least, um, necessary. Whereas, well, 
I think there's two questions. Number one, I mean, how do you define torture? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're talking uh, Saddam Hussein torture, uh, putting needles in people's toes and, you know, putting, you know, uh, 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 putting hot pokers in the eyes. I mean, if that's your definition of torture, ah, don't do that. Then no, it, it's not. It's never justified. No. I mean, you know, um, if your definition of torture is what was released, you know, in the um, the the, the uh, Justice Department memos, um, you know, I'm not. <laughs> you, you, you know, uh, maybe it's almost a point there. If you're gonna if you're gonna call some of that torture, you almost have to talk in terms of, um, yeah, you know, almost like murder. You have manslaughter, which is accidental murder. You have murder in the first degree. You have murder in the second degree. Right. You know, maybe you have to talk. You know, you know, degrees of torture. Then you know, is this torture in the first degree? Uh, you know, I mean, have you put somebody? On a on a, a wheel and spun them around. Have you put them on the rack? Are you putting hot pokers to their bodies? Um, you know, is this um, Gal Ducat dealing with Jean Luc Picard? Um, I mean, what are you looking at in terms of uh, you know? What do you mean actually in terms of torture? Um, because I mean, would some you know in my mind. Uh, 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 what some might argue is torture be allowable? Well, um, depending on the situation. I mean, you know, given you know they often talk about the the nuclear bomb uh, scenario where this guy knows there's a bomb, and he's sitting there smiling. Um, you know, there's that might be a a you know you know what what might be justified. I mean, I, I don't even say justified. What might be the lesser of two evils? Right. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's what we're talking about here. And that's what we need to understand when we're looking at this is, you know, on the one hand, the ends don't justify the means. Okay. Let's make that very clear. All right. Evil is evil. Um, you know, wrong is wrong. At the same time, yeah, there comes a point where you have to say, what's the lesser of two evils? You know, if, if, and I think. I think that part of the problem here is that most of the information that our government has gotten through various interrogation methods, um, and I am not really familiar what, with what those methods were, uh, partly because a lot of it was classified, um, and I haven't really read what has been released about it. But, um, you know, I know sometimes it was just a matter of, of, of humiliating someone, mocking them or, you know, or something like that, which I don't consider torture. I consider that high school. Um, and, um, but you know, what, uh, what are we talking about here and what is, you know, what are we going to gain by it? And, um, you know, the reality is, is that they have been able to save lives um, or so they claim, and I, you know, <laughs> I, I'm don't have access to the uh, to the documents to to say otherwise. Um, and if you know, if you can save people's lives um, through mild, you know, through what I would call interrogation methods as opposed to torture, um, mm -hmm. then you know, scare them a little bit or, or something like that. Um, you know, I just I guess I wouldn't call it torture. No. I mean, again, it, it comes to the question: How do you define torture? Yeah, I mean, um, and that, I think that's a very important question. And the second question then is: uh, 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 Under what circumstances? Uh, Charles Krauthammer last week in the Washington Post uh, had a very interesting um, opinion article on that, saying, you know, there there are times when certain things have to be justified. Um, and I guess what really, you know, okay, you know, that that, that somebody says that, you know, uh, um, and again, it, it really kind of gives me, I think it's interesting, uh, people that say uh, um, torture is often or sometimes justified. Well, putting those two together strikes me as very odd. Yeah, that's a big difference. Because say it's often justified, 
it's one thing to say it is sometimes justified. I mean, I would not put those two people in the same group. I would disagree with someone who says, like, you know, oh, I think, I think, you know, do whatever you want, whatever you want with them. Who cares? Well, no. It might be sometimes justified, but you'd have to, you know, come up with, you know, to me, a, a situation that justifies it, that there are, you know, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of lives at stake. Um, you know, something on the on the on the the level of another nine eleven. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, before I would say, okay, it's justified, but you know, um, there are the lesser of two evils. But to you know, to ask that question, you know, to put somebody who says often as as well, well sometimes together, I think those are two different things. And I'd like to kind of come up with which I don't know. Does it say anywhere which is which is more? Which got you know. Uh, often or sometimes? No, and you know, I I did not read the 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 details yeah. are there are available for the results of the survey. Um, so yeah, overall though, it's a forty nine percent says uh, that that's often or sometimes. A quarter said it never is. But again, I wonder if it was their brother or sister. You know, or their family, or their neighborhood. Yeah, how would you feel then? You know, uh, would you, you know, yeah, would you say, oh, no, 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 uh, let them all die, I don't care. Right, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, uh, put a blindfold on this guy and, and dangle him over a, uh, um, a two foot ledge, but we're going to make him think that he's, you know, hanging from a, a a 60 foot ledge and, uh, just so we can get some information out of him and, and save a lot of lives. Is that torture? Yeah, it would probably be considered torture and, you know, in uh, certain situations, but really he's, he's not in any danger. It's just to scare him into getting some information. If you can save lives doing something like that, I guess, I consider that the lesser of two evils. You're the margarine of evil. You know, I, I, I don't think we can make light of it. You know, I don't think that, that we can say, yes, it's a good thing, you know. Um, at the same time, th- you know, there comes a time where you have to do things that you don't want to do. Um, and it's, it's just because we live in such a, you know, such a mixed up sinful world. And I think that's the other part of this that I, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me the other part of this is it's almost has the idea that because I think this, you know, is sometimes justified, then, um, um, therefore I think it's a good thing. Right. Right. Yeah. It's totally different. You're the Diet Coke of evil. So, yeah, it, you know, it seems like a kind of a, I, I think it would be interesting to look at how several different news agencies covered this story and its results. Um, you know, take a look at, you know, this is the one we have is from CNN, um, but it was all over the place. Um, and I think it would be interesting to see how some of the more um, like really conservative, I mean, I'm not talking like Fox News, I'm talking like... Um, uh, World Net Daily, you know, or something like that, how they reported it and mm-hmm. compare them, um, you know, and, and even like with CNN, I'm, you know, let's, let's take a look at the other extreme, like the Huffington Post and see how they reported it, you know, and, uh, and really compare, you know, really different, um, perspectives on it. But ultimately, you, you know, you have to take a look at the, um, at the, the, the results of the survey, the, the exact results. And, um, and, and, you know, I find with these kind of things where the, these are sort of tough questions, I find it really helpful to read uh, different blog posts on it, d- different bloggers talking about it. And because, uh, you know, then you, you really get people's thoughts and it's more than just a sort of multiple choice. How do you answer this? I mean, I filled out a, a thing not too long ago, um, one, one of these sort of how, you know, where are you on the political uh, scale. And, um, and I, I got it all filled out and I, I'm, I'm reading these questions going, 
Oh, they're totally this, this question. I can't even answer this question. Um, because just the way it was worded, you know, it was, it was sort of like, um, Oh, I, I can't remember the the words now, but say say this. And in this case, it was a sort of left leaning um, one. So the things were were worded specifically to make you answer more uh, to the left. Um, and but you know, it's sort of like if if a conservative had written one up and said, um, you know, do you think that it's okay to kill babies? You know, or, or something like that. Like, okay, that's an abortion question. We know what you mean, but, you know, and it was that kind of thing. There was a lot of questions like that. And, um, and, and it said that where it rated me, um, on the, the left side of the axis. And, and I really don't, I consider myself more right wing than left. And mm-hmm. so I, I went, oh, yeah, okay. You know, these surveys, it just depends how it's worded. And so often when it's a sort of multiple choice or, or, um, you know, strongly agree, strongly disagree and stuff like that. It's like, I don't even know how to answer that question because it's a loaded question. You know, so I think you have to, sometimes you got to take these with a grain of salt. And, you know, of course, all the news, news agencies jump on these things. Oh, well, you know, this tells us a lot about these people. Well, no, the problem is it really doesn't because, you know, how many of these people just didn't really know how to answer the question because it was like, well, it depends, It you know, and not, not depends on, um, on whether or not people should be tortured it is it depends on what's your definition of torture. What are the circumstances? You know, what, what extremes are we talking about here? You know? So, so yeah, when you see these surveys, I always kind of really look at the questions uh, that they're asking and, and ask yourself, you know, how would I answer those questions? And would I be able to answer those questions uh, in such a way that it would actually convey what they're trying to determine? Why do you ask questions to which you already know the answers? Yep. It's always a question to ask. Okay, where should we go from here? Well, I don't have a good transition either way. I don't either. Uh, let's. Uh, oh, let's let let's go with keeping things flu free. Okay. Okay. Speaking of things that kind of get blown out of proportion. <laughs> okay. I believe. Um, by. F- Far, this whole swine flu thing has been um, blown out of proportion. If you think how many confirmed cases there are worldwide in terms of the percentage of people in the world, you realize that this is a minuscule thing for them to call a pandemic. Yeah, I heard that the if chances you, you, the chances of you dying from swine flu are the same as your chances of winning the Powerball twice. So if you all want to see a true pandemic, please check out the Black Plague. There we see a true pandemic. Uh, But as everything, again, people, I don't know, so this thing here, then talking. Um, this is from uh, uh, an AP from Boston, but I don't think it really makes a difference. Um, it's everywhere, you know. So um, Catholic churches in many dioceses uh, are not offering communion wine. They don't shake hands. They're you know they bow or nod. Um, um, uh, 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 um. Um, <laughs> one rabbi is making hand sanitizer available to stave off germs that can be passed from the Torah is touched. Uh, a Methodist church in San Antonio uh, is using individually wrapped communion wafers and juice packets 
uh, you know, so that people they're hermetically sealed, and so they know they can't, they won't get communion. Oh, this is a real good sign of the unity. Yeah, I just, you know, I just, you know, even as our hermetically sealed individual wafers and communion cups being passed out are all one, so we are all one in Christ, says Saint Paul. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, the person handing it out, did they wash their hands before they handed the package to you? Well, they probably have plastic, blue plastic gloves on, like they use for, you know, TSA um, or something like that, you know, and, they, and they're probably wearing surgical masks, too. Um, maybe they even have the little yellow aprons on, disposable aprons on. I Come on, at, at what point... Is just getting a little silly, and all of this I think is just absolutely silly. Well, last week we, you know, we 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 celebrate the Eucharist in my church every Sunday, and uh, so you know we use both common individuals as always. I didn't see any difference in the amount being used by anybody. Um, you know, <sighs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I haven't you seen know, any change I, either. I mean, I had to leave right after the second service in order to catch my my bus, catch the bus to catch the plane. And I told my congregation, I said, you know, please excuse me, you know, second service, please excuse me for not greeting you at the door. You know, I really do have to go. And, um, you know, again, you all understand that. And they did. And uh, nobody was was angry or anything. But I did hear later some people were kind of milling around going, what do we do now? The pastor's not back here to shake our hand. (laughs) You know, this is weird, you know, we're used to, you know, seeing him. Mess with our routine, yeah. Yeah, I mess with our routine. The emperor has been expecting you. So, yeah, oh, and the, the Muslims, too, um, there's a, a prayer time where people tend to be kind of all crammed into one room. And uh, so they're they're kind of debating about that one and say, well, maybe people should do this thing privately instead. Um a lot of these things are in uh, counties where there are confirmed cases, right? But, you know, something I've I heard uh, recently that, that made a lot of sense to me is the last time back in um, 1918 when this was a really huge thing and a lot of people died from it, um, which they're saying this isn't even the same strain, but it's related. Um, they said that a lot of people got it in the spring. And it wasn't real serious. And then they were immune to it when fall came around, when it really came back with a vengeance. And that's when the people started dying from it. The people that had already had it ended up being immune to it. So, and they're saying that that, you know, that could happen again, which, you know, could, you know, I don't know. But so it's like, so if you get exposed to it, you might be uncomfortable for a while, but unless you're um, one of those sort of, target groups with limited immune systems or something like that. Um, you'll probably just, you know, miss a few days of, of work or, or whatever. I mean, you know, it is treatable and, um, uh, most people will recover from it and, you know, I'm not a doctor or anything. So if you get it and die, don't sue me. But, but, uh, I mean, this is being so blown out of proportion that, you know, there is such a thing as May sweeps and it does affect the news stations as well. So if we can get people to watch more or listen more, or, you know, or whatever, hoo hoo. And so, well, what gets people to watch more than anything? Panic. So. Yep. So, you know, just be sensible about these things. Um, what I think one of the there was one good point in here. The Diocese of Dallas officials are assuring parishioners that it's not a sin to miss mass if you're sick. Yeah, if you're sick, stay home. Okay, that's right. If you are sick, stay home. I mean, whether it's swine flu or just a cold, or you know, or or whatever, stay home so you don't get everybody else sick. You know, even if you feel like, well, I, I can handle it, you know, no, don't stay home and, um, and, uh, catch, uh, 
you know, if if you want to catch a a church show on TV or on the radio, chances are there's one playing on Sunday morning, you know, listen to that instead. Or if your church has a media ministry uh, where they videotape services or something like that, catch that. Um, I know in some areas there's a program called Worship for Shut-Ins that comes out of a church in Fort Wayne, Um, you know. It's and it's syndicated all over. Uh, catch that, or you know, there, there's lots of different options for you. And uh, or you know, what I do, um, or what I used to do uh, back when we had satellite, um, when my kids were, were sick and they stayed home from church and Sunday school, I had them watch an episode of Davy and Goliath. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, just be sensible about these things. And, uh, or, you know, or for that matter, if you, if you can't, uh, find a, a, a program on that you want to watch, just, you know what, grab your Bible and, uh, just sit down and spend some time reading your Bible and praying, you know, you should do that every day, not just Sundays. But, you know, yeah, if you're sick, stay home. If you, and that would go whether, you know, you have swine flu or the normal flu or you have a bad cold or whatever. I mean... That would just go, um, you know, without saying that you should just simply stay home when you're sick. I mean, pastors are the exception to that. <laughs> right. Well, um, right. And, uh, you know, uh, in which case, I mean, I don't know about you. I've had times, once again, I've told my people, you know, I just real, I can't greet you at the door. I'm barely making it through the service. There was one time I had a really nasty cold. Um, I mean, it was really bad. And so I, 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 um, Skipped uh, the Lord's Supper. I didn't did did not commune, um, and I told the people that day. I said, uh, told the elders. I said, uh, I want you guys to do me a favor. Uh, I want you guys to, um, uh, you know, distribute distribute everything. Sure. You yeah. know. Impressive. Yeah. No, that's a good idea. So I mean, you know. For me, if when I'm sick, I mean, you know, cause here's the reality: when you're a pastor, unless you're, you know, falling over dead, you you really can't call in sick. You know, um, I, I've got the problem that I have allergies and they affect me the worst in the morning. So, uh, you know, if you come to my church, uh, there's a decent chance that on any given Sunday that you'll see me walk out at least one point uh, during the service, and I, I try to sort of time it in between things. Um, but I've just got to step out for a minute and blow my nose. I mean, because my allergies are just nasty. Um, generally, by the time I get to the sermon, it's settled down, which is which I'm really thankful for. Um, but uh, it's if but if I'm sick, and and generally I know I'm sick if if I get to the sermon or um, or after the sermon. And my nose is still running. It's like, oh, okay, then I do have a cold. It's not just allergies. And then uh, for communion, I take the individual cup instead of the common cup. And uh, and then um, since I distribute, I have an, an elder distributes the bread, um, he's the one sticking his hand in there and, you know, and picking them out. Um, I, I distribute the, you know, you, you hold the tray full of the little individual cups so you don't actually touch anything. And, and try not to breathe on anything or anybody. And um, and then, you know, the common cup, kind of same thing. I, you know, I'm not touching anything that's touching anybody's mouth. So that works out okay. And um, sometimes my allergies just really bother me. I know it's my allergies, but, you know, people can see that I'm having a little trouble. A lot. Of, I'll take the individual cup anyway just because I don't want to cause offense. So, um, but yeah, yeah, let's just be sensible. Don't panic. You know, this is affecting a a handful of people and yeah, it, you know, it's for the people that are dealing with it. It's not fun. And especially when you're talking about small children and stuff like that, it's scary for the parents and, you know, and, and obviously some people have died from it and, um, you know, and, and my heart goes out to those people, but you know, you have a better chance of getting in a car accident and dying a much better chance, um, you know, of, of dying in a car accident on your, on your way to or from church 
than you do of dying from some disease that you picked up at church. Now, young Skywalker, you will die. Yep. So let's go to Utah. They don't use okay. wine in um, in the Mormon church. They don't use juice packets. They just use water and bread for communion. But one other thing that they do not use is the cross. If you've ever seen a, a Mormon um, a temple or uh, what, what are the... Concentrate, Pinky, concentrate. What are they, the, there's the there's temples and there's tabernacles and what do they call the local steakhouse steakhouses, not to be confused with like a sizzlers, spelled differently s t a k e. That was I'm sorry that wasn't intended to be disrespectful, but um, they well you won't see a cross on the top of their building. It's an easy way to tell the you know because they tend to be they tend to look like churches. Um, usually white, um, but not always. And they, uh, you know, steeples and spires and all kinds of, you know, pretty stuff on them. Um, that sort of at a glance, it looks like a church, but you won't see a cross on the top of it or anywhere else on it or anywhere else inside of it for that matter. And, uh, so we got this article and, um, it's from the Salt Lake Tribune and, uh, basically, it's a history of why Mormons don't use crosses. And so, you know, you could say, well, it's not really a news story, but it's it's part of it. It's a guy's done some, um, uh, Michael Reed has written a book um, or a thesis, The Development of the LDS Church's Attitude Toward the Cross. And in a nutshell, they used to use crosses. Um, Joe Smith used a, a cross to mark the place where the um, where the first uh, temple or tabernacle should be built. Um, they have several different uh, bi- big big uh, names, uh, important people in the history of the Latter Day Saints has have used crosses. Um, mm-hmm. But it's just within the um, the 20th century that it's really fallen out of favor. And really what it comes down to, it's an anti-Catholic thing, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. And um, they say, well, we worship a risen Christ, um, not a, a crucified Christ. Uh, and yet... How did uh, how did Joseph Smith know that um, that this was Jesus that he was meeting? Well, according to you know his uh, uh, confession or, or whatever you call it, um, he identified himself with his wounds. All right, he pointed to the wounds, and so I don't know. It it seems is, is it a is it an anti Catholic thing? Um, you know, partly that's kind of the roots of it, but nowadays I think it's more of just a way to distinguish themselves to say, you know, we're, uh, we're the restored church. We don't use crosses. That's the, the, um, the other Christians or, or whatever you want to, how, whatever terminology they would use, um, you know, they use crosses, but you know it's it's sort of a, not like we're better than them, but we've got it right and they don't. So, you mean like Missouri Synod Lutherans? <laughs> well, you know, in, in the Missouri Synod, it's a, there's a, a ongoing debate about do you use a crucifix or an empty cross? You know, because Roman Catholics tend to use crucifixes um, overall. Not not exclusively, um, but and then in the uh, most Protestant, uh, other non-Lutheran um, denominations tend to use empty crosses. Um, uh, the Orthodox Church don't they use a like a Christus Victor kind of thing? Um, 
it kind of shows the risen Christ against you, like the cross as a backdrop, and then there's the risen Christ sort of standing in front of it. Um, that's what it's called. And so, you know, there's, there's different versions and, and some guys say, well, um, you know, the cross is meaningless with, there's not a beaten bloody corpse hanging on it. Um, and it, you know, I think it comes down to why, uh, you know, I, anytime you say we're not going to use the cross, that makes me kind of nervous. Um, because, you know, St. Paul said, I preach nothing but Christ crucified, or nothing but Christ and him crucified, you know? I mean, that's the central focus of the whole Bible. I mean, it is the basis for the, um, for, for the Old Testament sacrificial system. It was to point people to the one who would come and be the sacrifice that would pay for their sins. You know, and um, and you can say, well, we worship a risen Christ, but you know what? You can't have resurrection without the cross. You know, you can't have resurrection unless somebody dies. I did not know that. And, um, you know, I think I, I was talking to... Um, some atheist friends recently and they were talking about um oh the the whole all religions are the same i can't remember if i mentioned this last week or not um but you know i i, I shared the gospel with them and said you know this is the difference you know we teach that christians teach that um that we're saved completely by god's grace and they said well I've, you know i've been in a lot of churches i've never heard that before and i kind of went huh but the reality is that you can go into a lot of churches, um, Christian churches, and you they don't talk about Jesus. Um, he might get mentioned somewhere, uh, usually in a sort of what would Jesus do sense, not necessarily using that um, you know terminology, but um, sort of seeing Jesus as an example. Um, uh, in fact, I'm my uh, the the title of my sermon this week is. Jesus did not come to teach us how to love. And and the gist of it is he came to love us. That was his his goal. And uh and he didn't teach us how to love, he loved us and because he loved us um we are able to love each other. Um but it wasn't just to sort of set an example. Yeah, for both that I thought I was worried is uh Jesus did not come to teach us how to love. Therefore, we are all supportive of torturing people. <laughs> no, that's next week's <laughs> Oh, okay. You know, I had a, a, a situation uh, talking with someone who, uh, you know, uh, really believed um, that, uh, you know, who, who, who went to a church and where the church and the guy, you know, basically near as he could tell only thing it preached was why um uh why uh, um um george bush was you know god's choice for president this sort of thing has cropped up before and it has always been due to human error yeah and so that's what they preached every week you know i hear it all the time wow like an ongoing thing yeah yeah he said that you know every time he walked into it that's kind of what the guy was all about wow so. <clears throat> See, my daughter went to a, a church with a friend of hers a while back. Um, she spent the night Saturday night at her friend's house, and um, and then went to church with her the next day. And uh, she and I, so I picked her up, and it was a um, I don't, some sort of generic uh, evangelical kind of church. And um, and I picked her up afterward, and uh, and I said, uh, "So, what did you think?" And she says, it was all law. And uh, I say, yeah. And, and she said, yeah. And she says, I mean, like, I think they mentioned Jesus twice through the whole service. And and both times it was sort of like a Jesus wants you to be good kind of thing. And they never mentioned the cross. There was no gospel at all. Uh, she said, I think maybe once they said something about God loves us or something like that. But it was like, and I said, yeah, well, you know, you run into that. Um, 
you run into that a lot, right? I'm telling you, if you go to a church and your pastor does not regularly tell you about God's love for you and what he has done for you in Christ, um, that, that he has paid for your sin and, and be constantly reminding you of God's love and, and, uh, of, and of his forgiveness, go talk to your pastor and say, pastor, I would like to hear more about God's love in the services and in the sermons and approach your pastor very lovingly, but please go do that. It will be to your benefit. It will be to the rest of the congregation's benefit. And I firmly believe it will be to your pastor's benefit too. Just make sure you do it in a loving way. Mm-hmm. Do what must be done. Okay. Uh, why don't you give the warning for our last story? All right. Um, yeah, parental warning. This, uh, there'll be a little bit of, of uh, language. Now, we don't have a clean tag on our show, okay, but sometimes people watch it and go, um, oh, well, it's it's pastors, you know. Okay, but here's the thing. We do a podcast. Uh, one of the reasons we do it is because sometimes there's stuff that is worth talking about that you just can't talk about it from the pulpit because it's not real family friendly and there's kids sitting in the pews, you know, or there's old ladies sitting in the pews that would, you know, probably have a heart attack if you use certain words. Okay. We're about to use one of those words. Okay. So if you're watching this with your kids, man, what's wrong with you? No, but, um, <laughs> uh, you may want to, you know, send them out of the room or something at this point or pause it and finish later. Okay. Um, because when you heard the word climax in the, um, the opening little bit, yeah, that was a double entendre. Which Dale wrote. Yeah, I wrote that. Well, I, I was trying to come up with a way to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to introduce the story without using the O word. Okay. I mean, I don't want to use it right in the Oprah? opening. <laughs> yeah. No, no, we're not talking about Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, all right. So this is in Sweden and there was a man by the name of Carlos, um, Bebekua. I think so. He's, he's an artist and he wanted to start a church and the name of the church is Madonna of Orgasm Church. And, um, he wanted to register it as a faith community and the administrative court of appeal ruled that the name of the church violates what is considered acceptable praxis with its combination of the words Madonna orgasm and church. Disgusting. Um, so he said the church is aimed at encouraging people to worship the orgasm as God. He says the orgasm is God. The orgasm should be worshiped. The orgasm is the ultimate feeling of lust. It shouldn't be limited to ejaculation. You can reach it through art or by looking at a landscape and thinking, wow. Oh, good grief. I'm not going to comment on that last bit. I just... Maybe it works for him, but I'm not even going <laughs> to... Yeah. Okay. So basically, he, this, would this be, this be like Epicureanism? Um, you know, there is, uh, Oh, please. It doesn't even rank that high. This okay. is stupidity. Yeah. Okay. Epicureanism uh, was actually a philosophy. <laughs> right. This is just sheer stupidity. I mean, it's, 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 um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, violates what's considered acceptable praxis with its combination of the words Madonna, orgasm, and church, says the Swedish news agency. I mean, come on. Look. Romans 1. Paul says they worship the created things rather than the creator, and thinking themselves wise, they have become fools. Well, here it is. This is, this is somebody who thinks he's so wise, he's become an idiot. Yeah. Yep. I mean, By that last himself, paragraph you just read, can you honestly read that with a straight face? No. <laughs> did, you honestly, did you honestly sit there and say such idiocy? I mean, come on. So, I mean, could you believe such idiocy? 
you know, I, I come on. Let's just let's just don't be stupid, Mister. Um, <clears throat> but you know, he wants to play his little. I can have my little church, and I can just be very offensive to people. And you know, you all just have to like it. And, you know, go play your game somewhere else. Yeah, I don't have time for it. No, see, you know, and that's the thing in Sweden. Yeah, I I wonder how this would go. In well, in America, you don't have to like register them, okay? And people can basically have whatever they want because although well, it depends on where you're at. I mean, if you wanted to set up something like this, like in in San Francisco, um, you know, or Madison for that matter, um, then yeah, you probably get away with it. Uh, people, and people would be laughing and pointing, go, "This is funny." Right. Um. Try doing that in uh, rural Iowa. It wouldn't fly. All right. Uh, city, you know, you, you'd have, you know, city councils or, or whatever just saying, ah, oh, nope, sorry. You want to you wanna call it that? Fine. But you can't put a sign out front that has that. Right. I mean, it's interesting to me because, uh, you know, Sweden's known to be pretty liberal and secular. And yet they're even saying this is just no, no, this is just no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, this, you know, this did kind of remind me, and, and he's not going here because it's it's not uh, it, it's it's not like he's really you know thought this through, and that it's really a uh, you know I've, I I have to say I have more respect for the Jedi religion that we've talked about. Um, than this guy. Um, they actually at least have a set of teachings um, that they hold to, which we are basically Zen Buddhism. But um, the in the, in the the Old Testament, you know, you hear a lot about this Baal worship, right? Um, basically, the 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 concept behind Baal worship is Baal is the sky god, uh, the storm god, and uh, Asher was the earth god, the earth goddess, and so. Um, you wanted it was a fertility deal where okay we want rain uh to 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 fertilize to to make the earth fertile so that our crops grow okay so uh what we're going to do is we go to the temple and you pay a temple prostitute and you have sex right and and the idea here is uh these prostitutes are basically priestesses and um, the idea is to get uh, Baal, the sky god, in the mood um, so that he will um, have celestial sex with Asherah and rain down, which, man, you never look at rain the same again. But, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it kind of pours down on the earth. And it's just, you know, and, and you know, they didn't look at it the way that we do, you know, in our culture for them, it was a sort of very practical kind of thing. Um, and, uh, so, you know, that at least sort of made sense in the, um, what you call sympathetic, um, magic, the idea that our actions somehow influence nature. Um, and you know, it's, it's sort of like a voodoo doll. Um, you do something on a small scale and it has a large scale impact on, uh, on, on nature. And, uh, so, so even that was more thought out. Um, and, and which by the way, you can see why the Israelites were attracted to this. Um, uh, you know, it was sure more interesting than, uh, their church services, uh, especially when they were going and sacrificing animals and things like that. You know, what would you rather do? Um, but, uh, yeah, this is just, th this is like art taken to the extreme, um, just for the sake of, um, it's like a publicity stunt. You know, you, you kind of wonder, um, is, is he trying to sell more, more of his artwork or something like that? I mean, come on. I mean, I'm sorry. This is, you know, even, you know, 
even with all the talk of Dale worship and everything, this doesn't even rise to that high of a level. I don't I don't take this guy seriously for a second. I really don't. Yeah, I mean, you know, this whole thing is you look at stuff like this and you go, really? I mean, really? Do you really believe this? Is this really your philosophy on life and, and your whole life revolves around this concept? Um, I suppose maybe, you know, if if you're all about the carnal and, and that's all you care about, um, wow, that's just sad. So, so that's that. I don't want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yep. Okay, folks. Hey, you survived another week with us. Mm. Um, I don't know. Maybe you've got some comments on these stories, particularly that last one. Maybe I'm a little bit um, too negative on it. Um, but uh, I'm looking for your. We're looking for your comments and your thoughts. You can write to us at Crossfeed podcast at, at CrossfeedNews dot com. Thank you. Podcast at crossfeednews.com. So, and by all means, post stories. Go over to crossfeednews.com, post stories. Uh, reminder, if you're watching this on one of the video sharing sites like YouTube or Rever, um, that you can go to crossfeednews.com slash podcast and um, find the podcast uh, feed link there um, where there's much high, higher quality um uh, version than the heavily compressed versions that are on the video sharing sites. Um, it's about three times the size, just the, the file size. Uh, but that also tells you the difference in quality. Um, so, and yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Um, tell us what you think. And again, uh, no show next week, uh, but we should be back in a couple of weeks. So we'll see you then. So thanks for tuning in. And good night, everybody, and God bless. Good night. God bless. Bye-bye.